I'm PZ Myers, and I'm a raging atheist. You're going to have to yell, but sure. Okay. And ignore that guy standing over there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as a raging atheist, why, why are you an atheist? Why would you call yourself an atheist? Because I also happen to be a human being. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, oh, you you're. Them in, uh, oh, you're. You're not. The question is. Oh, I, I won't be on. I won't okay. Be on yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm also a human being, and that's why I tend to be a moral person because I sell, see myself as a member of a community of people, and we have to all get along. Sure. Um, or what do you value? Anarchy? <laughs> you know, family? Whatever it is. The kinds of things I value are peaceful communities, getting along well together, and working towards what I think are great common causes. I'm personally dedicated to advancing science, so I think it's important that we do that. I'm I'm very concerned about the environment, and I think we also have to work as a as a race, as a species, to pull that all together. I am going to shout. I just I want to make sure I'm on the audio. Yes, because this is. I was yeah. wondering about sorry. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. You're stuck staying there the whole time, but. <laughs> Yes. So, uh, what do you value? The kinds of things I value are, are the values of society, the values that bring us together to work as a community, to make us work peacefully, and to make us work towards good common causes. And the kinds of, of causes I tend to advance are the cause of science, greater understanding of the world around us, and also things like advancing our, our compatibility with the environment, that right now we have serious environmental challenges that have to be met as a people and also using the tools of science. Okay, so where do those values come from then, if not from a structured organization of some sort? Well, there's, there's no God that bestowed these beliefs and these values on me. Uh, where I got these ideas was largely from a, a normal, healthy upbringing with family who cared for me. That where I learned to be a good person is from my parents, not from a church, not from a pastor, from the people who raised me and spent all their time with me. And so that's, I think, where we all get our values is from interactions with other human beings. Right. So some people say we can't be good without God, but there is no God, so then I guess we can't be good. That's the only way to reply to that. Uh, the, the reason we are all good has nothing to do with an invisible, phantasmal being in the sky. The way we become good is by learning, by experiencing this in our culture, by learning from our family and friends. What we do is follow the example of the people that surround us, not the example of, for instance, that horrible evil tyrant who's described in the Bible. Well, some people appeal to the Bible as an authority of some sort. Uh, so why do you, I'm, I'm kind of going uh, devil's advocate a little bit. Yeah. Like, why do you reject the Bible? Okay. Like, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, so some people do claim that the authority of the Bible is a source of morality. But that can't be, because if you read the Bible, it's, it's actually a rather immoral book with all kinds of hideous actions taking place. I mean, we've got a, the Hebrews acting as genocidal maniacs using the support of their deity to go around enslaving and destroying large parts of Palestine. Uh, 
just that example alone says that's, a, that's an amor amoral story, an amoral book. So no, I don't find any particular virtue in the Bible as a lesson. Uh, you know, there's, there's greater books that you can read, and I will just cite one, and that's Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. When you read that, what you'll discover is that Darwin himself was a very humane person who thought highly of other human beings and thought about the advancement of our species as a whole. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that inspires me, that I find much, much better than this kind of racial mishmash that you find in the book of Genesis. Well, some Christians always say, well, the New Testament's different, right? Jesus had a different sort of, you know, he's a good guy. You know, why, why not go with him? Well, when you read the Bible, you know, there's, there's this weird dichotomy. People say that, oh, no, the Old Testament describes that tyrannical God but Jesus came and brought a new covenant, and he's the nicer, gentler God. That doesn't make any sense. So God apparently had a character change somewhere 2,000 years ago. I don't quite buy that. But also, the, book, the, the New Testament isn't that much better. Uh, it's misogynistic. It's still pushing the same old biblical ideas from the Old Testament. It demands that you respect the Old Testament. I noticed that Christianity has not thrown the first half of the Bible away. They still have both halves and maintain them as important rules. In addition, when you look at what Christians are doing in politics nowadays, they're doing things like demanding that the Ten Commandments be followed. That's Old Testament, in case you hadn't noticed. And it's, it's again, a collection of archaic, irrelevant, useless laws except for the obvious ones like don't kill and don't steal. Doing okay. Okay. Yeah. As an atheist, what I have to contribute to the world, I think, is a reality-based perspective. That what matters is what we see around us. This, this planet that we live on, the universe we live in, the, the people that live here. And those, those are not imaginary. They're not phantasms. They're not illusions generated by religion. And what we have to do is properly respect those and, and treat them with proper reverence that they're due. Often what we find when people are advocating biblical-based morality is they are promoting this, this sort of rote adherence to a text written down that's absolute and unchangeable and is never going to be changed. When what we've got is a much more fluid situation. We live in a very different world than was described in the Bible. And what we need is to be responsive to what we see around us. Uh-huh. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a leading question. That, yes. We, we, we often have this problem is that we're surrounded with believers who are trying to push their version of morality on us. And there's a couple of different ways we can approach this. And, and one is, yes, we should be vocal. We should come out and we should, for instance, point out the inconsistencies of the Bible and explain to people why this is wrong. The Bible promotes slavery, for instance. And yet we now reject that. Uh, the Bible calls homosexuality an abomination. 
And at least some of us are able to appreciate the fact that homosexuals are human beings and have as much rights as, right as we do to live their life as they want. So that's one approach, is go, go right for the guts of the book and tell them why this is wrong. Show them the, the problems with the biblical morality. But another one I think has even more impact in the longer run, and that is to simply live as atheists, as good human beings. That what you have to do is set an example. That what we find is that when people who are plagued with this biblical morality discover that their neighbor, who they respect, who they like, who's, who's a good person, uh, is an atheist, and no, they're not cooking babies on the barbecue, and no, they're not burning churches, and no, they're not coming over and knocking on their door early on Saturday morning and telling them to read God, Dawkins' God Delusion or something. They're actually being decent neighbors, good people. I think that has a lot of impact. That's, that tells them, that shows them better than it tells them that yes, you can be good without God. Uh, I was curious if, um, if, if your training as an evolutionary biologist uh, uh, sort of informed your, your ethics in any way. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, so uh, now I'm an evolutionary biologist and there's, there's a peculiar thing about that. One, one of the things that I've learned from being a biologist is the importance of reality, that how much the actual biology contributes to how we function. So I, I take a very naturalistic view of the world. But the other thing I got to tell you about evolutionary biology is you do not want to live by the rules of evolutionary biology. In evolution, it's harsh, it's pitiless, it's cruel, it's wasteful and inefficient. One of the things I know as a human being and as an evolutionary biologist that as a person, I want to live my life in opposition to evolutionary principles. I'm going to do my best to make sure that people don't suffer and die needlessly. Uh, like I said, evolution is, is a very wasteful process. What it took to make us, to get us to this point, is millions of years of death and destruction. And I think we know better than that. I think what we want to do is live a life where everyone has an equal opportunity to live and pursue their interests and be happy and get along with other people. And that's, that's what we've got to fight for. It's a very anti-evolutionary sentiment. Uh, I can give an answer to that. <laughs> yes, um, it used to be that I would tell people that I used to be a believer, that I was a Christian when I was a child. I was brought up in the Lutheran Church, a very liberal, progressive sort of church. And I, I actually left the church when I went through the confirmation process when I was in my early teens. But, you know, I've, I've since talked to many people and I've realized I never really believed, I was never a good Christian, that when I went to church as a child, it was a social event. It was because my friends went there for Sunday school. Uh, I treated the exercises they put us through as a kind of game. So I, I can't ever, I can't really now feel honest in claiming that I was ever a Christian. I was a nominal Christian. And then what happened in confirmation is I was told, this is what you have to believe in order to be a good Lutheran. And I said, wait a minute. I don't believe word one of that. That's all nonsense. And I had to leave. <laughs> uh, I had uh, one more question, if I, if I could. Sure. Um, for any given action, how would you uh, decide whether or not it would be ethical? Uh, so, for example, uh, I don't know, something good or something bad, like uh, stealing, for example. How would you decide whether stealing is ethical? Like, just uh -huh. for, for, for your ethical system. Yes. Uh, the way I make ethical choices is, is really simple, and it's well known. There's this, this common precept, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, the golden rule is something to live by. And so, yes, if there's something like murder or theft, I can say, no, I would not like to be murdered. I would not like to be robbed. Therefore, I should not do that to other people. Uh, on other things, you know, that, that there, you know, like for instance, right now in the States, one of the hot issues is gay marriage. 
And my feeling on that is dictated by how I feel about my own marriage. Would I be resentful and upset if somebody told me that it was not appropriate and that the state would not support my marriage to my wife? And I do feel like that would be an unwarranted and, and actually wicked intrusion on my life. And so I, I will bestow the same latitude on other people who choose to marry as they will. As long as it's mutually consensual, it has to be supported. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. One of, one of the most common tactics that believers will use is a very simple one. It's called fear. And what they do is they tell you, well, if you don't believe as I do, you will personally die and go to hell and you will suffer horribly for eternity. Or they say, if, the, if our state or province enacts this law, what that means is that God will hate us and he will smite us with natural disasters. There's, there's just this tendency to ascribe all kinds of horrible fates to anybody who opposes them. Uh, even if they don't act them out, it's still kind of daunting to have somebody tell you, oh, you're so evil, you're going to burn forever. So this, this is one thing they do all the time. And how do we oppose that? Well, we live lives without, without fear. That's the easy one. Why should you be afraid of supernatural threats? Why should these, these arguments have any power over us? They shouldn't because they're absolutely futile. They're actually, they're, they're, they accomplish nothing. We never see these disasters happening. States pass gay marriage laws and no, they don't get blown off the map by a supernatural disaster. So let's just get used to the idea that they are utterly powerless. They have no power over us and reject all those fear-based threats on our, on our lives. <laughs> when is the film festival? I would love to come to the film festival. Unfortunately, I am going to be in Oslo, Norway. Yeah, the World Humanist Con Conference is taking place in mid-August.